Prior to that was uh, ODI um, and an illustrious career um, in development um, um, times at the UN, Oxfam, um, and Kevin is speaking here tonight really about what's the theme of this Sussex De Development Lecture um, spring term series, which is all about the relationship between humanitarian aid and longer term development, and how those two work together and the boundaries are increasingly becoming blurred, and how we address that, especially as we move towards meeting the Sussex um, the, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Goals. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Kevin, and we'll be taking some questions at the end, but if you feel inspired to tweet, remember there's a hashtag, hashtag SussexDev. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, um, hi everybody. It's great, really great to be here, and, and thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I, I should say right at the beginning that I'm, a, I'm almost uniquely badly qualified to be doing this talk, because I don't have a humanitarian background. And actually the only qualification I have for doing it is that um, I have worked with people who are really great thinkers on humanitarianism and practitioners on humanitarianism. In the Overseas Development Institute, there's, uh, there's a group called the Humanitarian Policy Group, which I, I think is doing some of the best thinking on the challenges facing the humanitarian sector. Uh, which is led by Sara Pantoliano. And in Save the Children, around half of our programs now are humanitarian programs and we have an absolutely extraordinary humanitarian team some of the most professional dedicated thoughtful people i've ever worked with the really good news from my point of view is that you haven't invited any of these guys to be here so i can get away with saying pretty much anything i want of this but uh, so i've, I've learned a huge amount from the, the people i've been lucky enough to work with but also since I started at Save the Children, as, as you said, about 18 months ago, I've probably done about um, seven or eight field trips now. And each one of them has been humanitarian. So the, 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 the first trip I did was to uh, northeast Nigeria, to Borno State, where, as, as a lot of you will know, there's a very violent conflict that's going on with uh, Boko Haram and, and other groups. And then uh, I've been to Somalia and Yemen a couple of times. So I, I've had sort of rapid immersion into humanitarian context. And I'm approaching the theme of this lecture really just through the prism of personal reflections on um, what I've seen since I started at Save the Children and, and what I've read. Um, what, one of the things that I did, that be, because these are great academic institutions that have come together to convene these meetings, I actually thought I should immerse myself a bit in some of the academic literature on it. So I did roughly a six-hour immersion course. And the, the, the interesting thing, if, if you um, Google humanitarian development nexus, which is the theme of this um, lecture series, you get a, a, a lot of stuff comes up that um, I realised I was very familiar with from the early 90s. And actually, it, it's like um, it, when you read a lot of the literature, it's almost like listening to cover versions of great hits from the 1990s. Because if you went back to 1991, there was a General Assembly resolution which spoke of the critical importance of linking relief to development. So that was the, the bus phrase at the time. And the perception at that time was that, you know, we had a humanitarian system and we had an emerging system of development finance and development aid in, in the uh, DAC, the Development Committee, but that they weren't really linked up. And that because they weren't linked up, linked up humanitarian interventions were not being done in a way that supported long-term development. Um, and that gradually transmuted over time um, into the idea of a humanitarian development continuum. You know, this idea that the aim of humanitarian intervention was to set the scene for development. And th there were some very critical debates that went on around that time. Actually, a lot of them in this very institution from Mark, with uh, Mark Duffield, and others who were very critical of, uh, of a lot of these concepts. And what, what underpinned it, if you stand back and you said, you, you know, that what was the fundamental proposition of people who were writing about 
the humanitarian development continuum or the relief to development agenda. It was basically this idea that humanitarian interventions were a very temporary thing, that you know, th these were quick responses that you needed to do to emergencies, but you needed to do it in a way that would provide the foundations for long-term development. Um, and of course, within that general packaging, there were some very distinct political agendas and strategic agendas. So the humanitarian development continuum got linked to the idea of state building and peace building. And these were in very specific conflict, post-conflict or conflict-related settings. So in the, in the early 1990s, it was in you know, the sort of the African post-Cold War context in Mozambique and elsewhere. You know, the idea that we needed to go from humanitarian to building the state, building institutions, that this would be a smooth process. Um, it, it, it later, of course, got linked in Afghanistan to the agenda around building the post, what was supposed to be the post-conflict agenda in Afghanistan. And then with the invasion of, um, of Iraq and Syria, we've seen it playing out in, in those contexts. So the, these are very political agendas that we're talking about. I, I don't want to get, there's a lot of critical literature on all sides of the debate here, which you'll, you'll be delighted to hear, I'm not going to get into in any, in any depth. But what, one of the things that's very striking about the debates that, you know, that I've had some insight into on the humanitarian development nexus is a lot of those old themes have re-emerged. So, for example, a lot of I mean, this is a caricature to say this, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, th there are a lot of people in the humanitarian community who would say, look, th there is something profoundly distinctive and different about the humanitarian agenda. That the human humanitarianism is about impartiality. It is about the Geneva Conventions. It is about doing whatever is needed on the basis of pure neutrality to help people whose lives are threatened by conflict. So that, that would be a sort of purist version of, of, of that argument. And the, the next step of that argument would be development is inherently a political process that because it involves states, because it involves institutions, because it involves questions about who is going to benefit from resource allocation, you're immediately into the muddy waters of politics. On the development side, uh, and again, I'm talking in caricatures here, there, there are people who say, you know what these humanitarians are like. You know, they, they love nothing more than to don their SAS-style jackets, jump on an aeroplane, get out there, dig a borehole, and get out again as, as quick as they can. Now, I, I have to say, I've, I haven't met a single humanitarian person in Save the Children who thinks like that, and I haven't met a single person who thinks seriously about development who thinks like that. But there is that sort of residual undercurrent. And to, to my mind, thinking about it very simply, what, what the concept of the humanitarian development nexus is trying to do is to start from the world as it might appear to somebody who is affected by a crisis. Um, because people who are affected by a crisis clearly have profound humanitarian needs. But the reason they have profound humanitarian needs is often because they've been failed by development, because of broader development failures, because of the insecurity of their livelihoods, because of the failure of state systems to provide the health services, the livelihood support systems that they might need. Um, so that's by, by way of some background reflections. What, what, what I want to do is to talk about three broad areas, which is first of all the functioning of the humanitarian, sorry, four areas, which is first of all just to say something descriptive about what is happening in humanitarian and humanitarianism and to the humanitarian system. Secondly, to focus a bit on financing 
Um, thirdly, because I think it illustrates some of the real weaknesses in the current humanitarian system to talk about education and the provision of education. I think somebody wants to come in. So, okay. Um, and fourthly, I, I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about rules and law. Um, so that's what I want to do. But for, first of all, I know a lot of you will be thinking, look, we've got a speaker from an NGO here. Surely this guy at some point is going to give us an anecdote because that's what NGOs do. And um, I don't want to disappoint you. So here comes the anecdote. Have I, can I just get... Oh, this is great. Uh, I also won't disappoint you because obviously the NGO speaker can't work out how to use the clicker. <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, so, look, I, well, the, the, the reason I want to tell this anecdote is because for me it captures the artificiality and, to be honest, the pure irrelevance of a lot of what I see as some of these quite heated debates over the humanitarian development nexus. And th this is a little girl whose name is Aisha. And I met her 10 days ago in Yemen, in, uh, an area, in, a, in a town called Hadeda. And those of you who follow the Yemen conflict will know that th this is an area that has been right at the heart of the conflict. So it, it used to be the main port in Yemen. It was the port through which around 70% of commercial imports into Yemen used to flow. The port has been destroyed by Saudi airstrikes, targeted airstrikes on the cranes that used to un unload the ships. Um, and as in most parts of Yemen, there is now a, you know, a profound human development crisis. But the thing about this little girl, I, so I met her when I was visiting our nutrition clinic in Hadeda. Um, and she was being um, measured. And as you can see from the tape on her arm, this is an indicator of uh, upper arm circumference, which is one of the ways of measuring um, the nutritional status the, the, of, of children. And she was very deep into the red zone. And the, the red zone is an indicator for severe malnutrition, that is potentially life-threatening malnutrition um, unless it gets treated. And I had an opportunity to spend a little bit of time talking with her mother, who um, I asked if she would let me go to the family's home the next day to talk a little bit more about what had happened to this girl and her circumstances and what, what had put her there. And um, so this was, this was the mother. She, she actually had um, five children. The, the other one, who was 10 years old, so, sorry, 12 years old, uh, was actually out working when I visited, collecting plastic bottles in order to raise um, some money. And what the mother told me was that um, six weeks before this little girl, Aisha, um, had been treated in the same clinic and referred to an emergency stabilization unit, which we run in, in um, Hadeda. And she was admitted to that clinic with severe gastroenteritis, with acute respiratory infection, and severe malnutrition. And she was in the clinic for five days. Um, she just about survived. Um, she was sent home. And here she was again, um, six weeks later, in severely malnourished status. And I asked the mother just to explain to me, yeah, what, what, what is it that, is, that makes it impossible or so difficult to feed the children? And she said something very simple, which is, I don't have enough money. Um, and actually right outside their house was a vegetable market, which had pretty much every vegetable you could think of. She couldn't afford any of the vegetables. The children were essentially being fed on small amounts of rice and small amounts of potato. She'd taken two of the girls out of school because she could no longer afford to send them to school. The reason she couldn't afford to send them to school is that the payroll system has collapsed. 
So no teachers have been paid in the northern governorates of Yemen for about 18 months. Um, and so now parents have to pay themselves to send their children to school. Um, her husband used to work in the port and had lost his job, um, along with about 20,000 other people who were either directly or indirectly employed in the, report, in the port, and was now trying to eke out a living as, uh, as a scooter taxi driver. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. So the, yeah, this was a complicated story. But the, the, what I want to get across to you is that if you said to that mother or that child, what about this humanitarian development thing? You know, what is most important? Is it the humanitarian intervention or the development intervention? It's actually just a dumb question. You know, these are people who are dealing with the consequences of profound collapse in livelihood systems. The willful destruction by the Saudi-led coalition of public service provision in a country which has been subjected to a humanitarian blockade by the Saudi-led coalition, a country which has been systematically bombed, over a thousand schools uh, partially or totally destroyed. Um, and the reality is that you know, if you ask yourself not whether this is a development crisis or a humanitarian crisis, you know, th this is a, a real people crisis. And if you don't have a joined up solution, you, know, you, you can do humanitarian interventions like this. So th these boxes that you see here on the left is our standard nutritional intervention in, say, the children. This is called plumping up. And it, you know, it's, it's essentially a high nutrition, protein based mix. Now, you know, we, if you can reach a child like that, and there are many children you, you, you can't reach or we can't reach, you can keep them alive. Um, but if every six weeks, because of the wider failure of the system, because of the growing poverty of many households, that kid is going to be back in that clinic, a humanitarian intervention on its own doesn't work. And clearly just a development intervention on its own without humanitarianism wouldn't work either. I use this example not, not just because it's a, a, an individual story, which, you know, which is profoundly moving, actually, when, you're, when, you're, when you meet mothers who are, who are trying to cope with their, you know, the, the emotional crisis and the financial crisis that puts a child like that, but because it's part of a wider crisis at the heart of this humanitarian development nexus theme. You know, there, there are 400,000 children in Yemen today who are in that, who, who are in that condition. Um, so um, I, I want to move on now to say something about the functioning of the humanitarian system. Um, and there are a whole lot of caveats that I'm, I'm not going to go into in detail here, but it, it's very difficult to compare humanitarian financial data across years for all sorts of um, reasons. But if you'll just bear, bear with me, this chart, sh um, th this basically uses as an indicator of humanitarian need, um, UN humanitarian appeals broken down by country, and I've just taken three years, 2011, 2015, and 2018. And as you can see, back in 2011, those appeals amounted to around, um, to around 8 million US dollars. The appeal this year, 2018, is for around just under 25, mil, uh, 25 billion, sorry, not, not million, uh, 8 billion up to 25 billion US dollars. In other words, the appeals for humanitarian purposes have increased um, threefold over a period of just five years. That's predominantly because of the emergence of major conflicts in middle-income countries, in particular as a result of the, um, as a result of the Syria crisis the, uh, and, and the regional refugee crisis that that has created. The number of people affected by humanitarian crisis has also grown exponentially. And the number of appeals um, that are pitched at a level of over one billion 
US dollars has increased from three back in 2011 up to seven now. So the, one of the features, and, and this is a source of great strain on the humanitarian system, that it's having to respond increasingly to crises, n not just in low-income countries, but in middle-income countries where the costs of intervention, uh, uh, the cost of reaching people uh, are significantly higher. Um, the, 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 these are the numbers for appeals. T typically, if you look at the response to the appeals last year, they're only half funded. So the appeals are based on an assessment of need, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But the, the needs that are assessed secure a financing provision which is equivalent to half of the level that um, that is pitched. So th this points to a picture of financial strain um, on um, on the humanitarian system. It'll also be evident that if you look at the countries that are affected, the, these are countries that are now really right at the heart, not just of the humanitarian crisis, but of the Sustainable Development Goal challenge. Yeah, the Sustainable Development Goals has had a whole range of um, ambitious targets, eradication of poverty, uh, eradication of malnutrition, ending avoidable child deaths, getting every child into secondary school, um, and, and these sorts of goals. The countries that are falling further and further behind in relation to those goals are precisely the countries at the heart of the, of the humanitarian crisis. And this is a mix of countries which would include large parts of Nigeria, like Northeast Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, you know, the traditional fragile state in inverted commas territory, but also countries where the humanitarian crisis has, has prompted people to fall an awful long way. Just to give you one example of that, if you, if you take Syria, um, six years ago, Syria was a country with education indicators that were comparable to the indicators that you would have found in Thailand. Today, if you, if you took the entire Syrian population, including the displaced population inside Syria and the refugee population that is in Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan, this is a country that has refugee indicators that are actually closer to South Sudan than Thailand. That is in the space of one single primary school generation. You know, there has probably never been a reversal in human development of, of that pace and that intensity in a single primary school generation in, in history. I hesitate to say that with Richard Jolly in the audience because Richard knows more about human development than anybody. But I, you know, I, I, I would put as a pretty safe bet that I, I can't think of a single case where you, you've seen an education reversal of, um, of, that, of, of that scale. Um, it, it, if you look out towards 2030, there are very few reasons to be particularly optimistic about the picture that emerges from, from this. Um, and I'll just run through some of the issues that will have a bearing on that scenario. If you think of basic demography, the, the countries that are furthest from the demographic transition, in particular in West Africa and Central Africa, um, are, are countries which are right at the heart of the humanitarian challenge. So you, the, these are countries which will account for a growing share of the world's young population. And of course, an increasing number of these children would be born right into humanitarian, um, fragile contexts. If you think of climate change um, as something that is exponentially driving up the risks facing vulnerable people, you know, if you think of the recent droughts in the Horn of Africa, it, of course you can't say that these are climate change droughts, but what you can say on the basis of all of the evidence that's been collected by the IPCC and others on climate change, we, we know that the effects of climate change include greater variability 
greater uncertainty and variability in uncertainty can have deadly effects for a small farmer that is unable to manage risks. We know from assessments of conflict that the, many of the conflicts behind these emergencies are characterized not just by um, longer time frames. I think I'm right in saying the, the average conflict going on in the world today has lasted for around 17 years. So that, you know, the, these are long-term conflicts. They're conflicts which involve a multiplicity of actors. You know, one, one of the things we have to do when we do these trips and save the children, on the first day you get a security briefing. And last month I was in North Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You get a security briefing in North Kivu and you have a list of about 40 armed groups just in that one area. So the, these are states which are fragmented in which state power, state authority has effectively been captured by, um, by armed groups. M most of the conflicts, and, and conflict is the, the biggest driver of, of many of these emergencies, very few of these conflicts have you know, what I would describe as peace processes that point in a particularly hopeful direction looking ahead. I could go on, but the, 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 the last thing I'll say on the scenario side is that if you look at the wider landscape for multilateralism, for international support, for universalism, for international cooperation, it, it, it's difficult to look at the realities of what, are, what is happening in the United States, what is happening in this country, what is happening across much of Europe, and come out of that assessment with a great deal of optimism. And so I, I would say many of the sort of the core foundations that could support effective humanitarian intervention are, are being steadily eroded over time. Um, what, what I started off by saying a little bit earlier that the appeals process points to the growing strains on the humanitarian system. Um, and that there's a large and growing gap between the humanitarian needs assessment and what is actually delivered. And um, I, I'm going to illustrate that in a moment in relation to education, but it's very important, and those of you who are working on humanitarianism will, will know this, that the, 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 the needs assessment process is actually quite a complicated one in the, in the UN system. So it essentially operates at a country level. Uh, it's overseen by the um, UN OCHA, the Humanitarian Affairs Agency. It brings together NGOs. Um, and what it tries to do is to look at the humanitarian landscape and to estimate what would be the financial cost of an effective response. But it, it, in, in most of the cases, the effective response is actually really an assessment of what could be delivered. It's not a needs assessment in the sense that many people would understand it, of saying what is the aggregate sum of the needs of people who have been affected by a humanitarian emergency and how do we respond to that. It's actually an assessment of, given the humanitarian state in the country, what could be delivered through NGOs, through government, through UN agencies, and that's highly variable. And so there's a very big discrepancy between the real needs of people and the needs that are assessed in these areas, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But al alongside the financial challenge, the aggregate financial challenge, there are a whole bunch of additional challenges. Um, let, let me give you one example, which is a bit of a parochial one from, say, the children. If you, um, uh, a, f a few months ago, I, I, visit, I visited our program in South Central Somalia, where in response to the drought that happened in 2016, we established a, quite a wide range of health and nutrition clinics. And our Somali program is, is an interesting one. Uh, there are around 900, we have around 900 staff 
in Somalia. They're all Somali, by the way. This is a you know, Somali-driven enterprise. And when we, expand the pro when we expand the program to deal with specific emergencies, we basically do it by paying for health, Somali health workers, Somali nurses, who are under the governance auspices of the Ministry of Health or whatever the respective ministries are. Um, and then we'll support them to deliver the service. And during the drought, we built up a, a whole infrastructure of health and nutrition support, ranging from mobile teams that would go out into very remote areas and do nutrition assessments to referral clinics at two different levels, severe referrals and, and more uh, acute level referrals. But the, the average financing pipeline for those health facilities is nine months. Nine months. Now, just think about that, your local hospital. You know, try to imagine you've got one local hospital and it's being funded on the basis of nine months, six months, one year pipelines. We have whole teams that are desperately trying to crank out funding requests to, do to donors to extend it from nine months to 12 months. This is not the way you finance an effective response because if those clinics close, the, the, these are people with literally nowhere to go. And the reality, and this is one of the biggest challenges in humanitarianism, that the crises that we're dealing with, and, and actually this is what the humanitarian development nexus idea is trying to get at, these are not short-term emergencies that have a quick fix. These are long-term development crises, crises which have hum what I would describe as humanitarian spikes attached to them. But you know, if, if, if you build up a whole infrastructure on the basis... Uh, and, and actually nine months is the average like a lot of these mobile clinics are funded for three months or less so you know, th th this is an incredibly inefficient system because setting the system up has a very big sunk cost attached to it there's, there's a capital cost of creating facilities in some cases or renewing facilities you know, there are all of the recruitment related costs, there are the equipment costs, and then you run the risk nine months later that you may have to close it down. So you know, that, that is a, 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 a deep bill inefficiency in the system. Um, what I would describe as another inefficiency is the undue focus on responsiveness. Now, it goes without saying that humanitarianism is all about being responsive to crises. But you have to ask, what is the most cost-effective and human development effective intervention? And in a lot of cases, you know, the, the number of countries that I've been to where we and other NGOs are supporting water truckers, you know, that we, we will pay for water to be trucked from place A to place B. The costs are utterly phenomenal. Like, I can't remember. If I, if I told you the unit cost, you know, it's probably higher than the unit cost of a bottle of Evian water. If you previously invested in a borehole for the communities that have been affected, a crisis prevention intervention, you would save that cost. But securing the resources you need to do the borehole investment in a fragile state where long-term development actors will look at a country like Somalia or Yemen and say, you know, this is not a long-term development project. These are humanitarian countries. These are fragile states. So they qualify for humanitarian funding. You know, you, you, you don't build effective water and sanitation systems with humanitarian funding. You build it with long-term development investment. And, and you know, I, I would apply this in many other areas as well. That, that, you know, the, the, the number of families that I've met in southern Ethiopia or Kenya or Somalia who will tell you that following the drought um, they all sell off their stocks particularly of goats now the poorest people will hold on to those goats because they're a saving asset for as long as they can those assets will deplete over time because they don't have access to fodder and they will sell them at bargain basement prices and it'll take them seven or eight years to rebuild those assets back up Again, if somebody had come along right at the beginning with an insurance intervention or a fodder subsidisation intervention, 
people wouldn't be forced to wipe out their assets and it would make recovery easier. But again, securing funding for that type of intervention is more difficult. You know, we know that safety nets and cash transfers are incredibly effective in these interventions, but they're, they're massively under-deployed. And these are all areas in which, to my mind, the, the uh, humanitarian community and the development community could be more effective than, than we've been so far. And he, here's, here's another area. Th this is a map of Somalia. Um, and I, I want to make this point because I think it highlights a financing issue and a coordination issue. Now, Somalia is a country, you know, if you say the word Somalia to most people, immediately they think fragile state. And there are parts of Somalia which are profoundly fragile, like the south central area in particular. There are many parts of Somalia which actually aren't that fragile, where it's perfectly possible to do long-term development work. But almost all of the finance that's going into Somalia um, is short-term humanitarian finance. And here is how it's delivered. So these are agencies which, in response to the 2016 crisis, delivered financing of $10 million or more in Somalia. That's $10 million or more, okay? Um, these are the actors who delivered financing of 5 to $10 million. These are the actors who delivered financing of $1 to $5 million. And these are the actors who delivered financing of less than $1 million. Now, um, I could probably find a way of expressing in narrative terms what, a, what the two words uh, coordination challenge actually mean. That is a coordination challenge. What, what, what you have is, despite the best efforts of the cluster system, as it's called, in Somalia, the, the, the best efforts of people to collaborate, there is duplication, there is an over-concentration of resources in some areas and a massive under-provision of resources um, in, in other areas. And I'll just add um, one point before I move on from Somalia, is that um, some of you in this room may have studied debt relief and debt sustainability in Africa. And you'll be aware that um, through the heavily indebted poor countries initiative, most of the countries with unsustainable debt profiles in, in Africa had them written off several years ago. Um, there are three countries that never went through the heavily indebted poor countries initiative. One of them is Somalia. Um, so Somalia is a country which has very large debt arrears to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Because it has very large debt arrears, it's not eligible for long-term development finance from the World Bank, from the International Development Association, or from other donors. And actually, the debt of Somalia... Actually, one of you must do a master's thesis on this, by the way. Um, the debt of Somalia is a really interesting case study because almost all of it was accumulated um, between about 1980 and 1983. Um, the vast bulk of it was from the US Department of Defense. Um, and the US Department of Defense and other US agencies have been charging penalty interest rates for non-payment since 1983. And so... Somalia now has a total debt profile, I think, of around 9 billion US dollars, of which 92% is non payment on arrears. 92% non payment on arrears. Now, um, I don't think anyone in their right minds believes that a single cent of that money is going to be repaid, unless a donor chooses to repay it. To, um, and yet, even now, when you go to the International Monetary Fund and you talk about this, or you go to the um, US finance authorities, they, will, they categorically refuse, or at least they have done until recently, to discuss the prospects of Somalia 
being allowed to enter the heavily indebted poor countries initiative. If it was, it would make it eligible for the IDA financing that could have funded the boreholes, that could have supported the irrigation systems, the health systems, the education systems, that would make the country less prone to the type of crisis that we've seen. Um, the, the, the second thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the role of international agencies and local actors. And those of you who, who have followed this will know that at the World Humanitarian Summit and under the grand bargain that came out of that summit, there was a commitment to increase the share of humanitarian aid that go through local actors. Um, the, 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 small, um, the small blue strip is the share of humanitarian aid that go through local actors. And I draw attention to this because what it points to is the role of intermediation in the humanitarian system. Um, and intermediation works in some weird ways. Um, the UK government will transfer financial resources to a UN agency, UNICEF, UNHCR, who will contract us, especially if it's, if it's in a conflict area where UN agencies aren't operating, who will contract us and we will contract a local partner. So this is a three-step intermediation process. And you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you as someone, you know, I, I mean, I, I work for an international NGO and I think international NGOs have a really important role to play. But this balance is unacceptable and it's wrong. Uh, you, we, we need to find ways of getting more resources directly to the groups on the ground with access to the areas that need to, to, um, to be reached. Um, I, I, want, I want to turn now, here's another anecdote coming up. <laughs> Two anecdotes. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to use this, this one because um, it, th this was a really striking story. So the, the, his name is Daniel, and uh, I met him in northern Uganda. He's, he's a refugee from Equatoria in South Sudan. Um, and so I met him about three months after he'd arrived in Uganda. <laughs> And I actually met him in what was supposed to be a school, but it was, was actually just a very big tent um, with a few chairs and desks and no books. And a teacher who was teaching in English to a group of South Sudanese refugees who didn't speak English. Um, and I noticed this guy at the back of the, the class. He, he was actually the only one with a book. And so I, I went and spoke to him after, um, and he spoke English. He was the one in the class who did speak English. Um, and I, I asked him about the book, and, so, and he described to me what had happened to him. Um, and so he, he was living in an area in Equatoria, which is actually the most educated part of South Sudan, by the way. And um, a militia had arrived in his village. And the, 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 the militia is actually, you know, the, these, the, in this area, it was a government-supported SPLA militia. Uh, they'd ransacked his village, killed a lot of people, uh, abducted his sister, his mother and brother had fled into the bush. And he fled to Uganda. Um, and I said to him, well, how comes you've got this book? And he said, well, when I fled, I, I ran past my school because I had to get this book. And, so, and I said, but why, why is the book so important? And he said, well, I want to be a scientist. And it was a completely extraordinary book, actually. It was full of scientific stuff, you know, electromagnetic fields and, and that sort of thing. Anyway, his story was that he had walked for two days. He had no shoes, even when I met him. He had no shoes, but he arrived with this book. And if you want a sort of manifestation of the human spirit, you know, you guys all believe in education, that's why we're all here. But if you want a manifestation of the human spirit and ambition, that is it. However, he arrived 
in Uganda, along with just under a million South Sudanese refugees, to a place where there was no provision for education, no agencies taking responsibility for delivering education. Um, so his ambition was unmet. And that raises some very profound questions about what is going on in the humanitarian system. Because if you speak to the parents of refugees or to refugee kids, I, I'm always amazed by this. They, they always rank education as one of the top things they want. And there's a really good reason for that, which is they see education as the one thing that no one can take away from you. You know, and it, it'll give you a chance when you go home. It'll give you a chance to improve your life. Or if you can't go home, it'll give you a chance of doing better than you might otherwise do in the host country that you're in. There are all sorts of other reasons why education is valuable. You, you know, having adolescents in school, especially in conflict areas, rather than out of school where they're really easy prey for people who might try and recruit them for violent purposes. But the humanitarian system is profoundly failing people like Daniel. Um, and I just wanted to explain some of the reasons why that is. And this is back to this needs assessment. Um, there's a deliberate error in this graph, by the way, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. But, but what, what this graph shows you, the, the yellow lines um, are from needs assessments as indicators of children identified to be in need of education. So in Yemen, there are something like 2.8 million children identified in the needs assessment as needing education. The actual appeal for education is for one million children. So basically the needs assessment is essentially saying, for, you know, forget about 1.8 million of these children because they're not going to go back into school. Uh, I've just talk, spoken about the Uganda case. There are the numbers behind Uganda. There are about 800,000 children who were in need of education and the appeal was for just under 300,000. So there's a big gap. The figures on Iraq are, are wrong. But the Rohingya figures, you can see there, this huge um, flow of Rohingya children into Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, the poorest part of Bangladesh, with the most overcrowded schools, the worst education indicators. The appeal was for under 100,000 children, and around 400,000 actually needed support to get back into school in the, in the appeal document and whoops and the the reality is that education currently accounts for something like 2% of global humanitarian financing and the question that i want to put to you that this really begs is isn't it the responsibility of the humanitarian system or, or the humanitarian system and a joined up UN system to ask a very different question from how many children might it be possible for the NGOs that happen to be there to reach, to ask a different question, which is what would it take to get every single refugee child back into school? That's the question that matters. And that is the question that nobody asks. We've actually done some work on the costing work for a number of countries, including <coughs> Uganda, which attempts to address that question. Um, can I just ask how long I've got left? Um, I would say another five minutes. Ten five minutes. minutes, okay. Um, so I, I, wa I, I want to end just with uh, a, a, a quick reflection on what I described earlier as some rules and law based issues. Um, and, and I want to deal with these in the, in the context of um, conflict. And I think all, all of us have an insight into the problem I'm about, just to say, I'm about to say a few words about, which is if you turn on your TV tonight or you open a newspaper on the foreign news pages, um, what, what you'll skim through or what you, what you will see is cases of attacks on indiscriminate attacks on civilian populations, including children. 
If you look at what is going on in East Ghouta, if you think back to what we saw in Idlib, in Raqqa, in so many other contexts, the, these, the, the, this is an age in which indiscriminate attacks on civilian populations has become the new normal in warfare. And it's happening in the context of the urbanization of warfare. Um, you, you know, the, the scenes that we see from Syria today are actually eerily reminiscent of what we saw from Chechnya in an early generation. Actually, they're reminiscent of what images that we saw from Stalingrad. Th this idea that using high ordnance explosive devices indiscriminately in densely populated um, urban areas has become normal. <coughs> and I would say... This is part of what I would describe as a growing war on children. And what I would encourage all of you to read, if you went back to 1997, there was an extraordinary report that was written by Grasse Michel. And it was on the impact of armed conflict on children at that time. And she described in graphic detail some of the big challenges and, and, uh, of the, the children were facing, you know, the, these ap ap appalling crimes being committed against children. And she used a phrase in the report, which when I read it the first time, really stuck with me, where she said that the world, uh, that there, there is no greater depth of moral depravity than what we see happening to children in countries affected by armed conflict. The, the only thing she got wrong in that report was that observation, because we are plumbing ever greater depths every day. Um, it has become normal for children to be deliberately targeted in war. It has become normal in war to rape and sexually assault girls. It has become normal to kidnap children from schools. It has become normal to bomb hospitals. And actually, after Grass's report was published, they set up under the UN a system which now oversees monitoring of six violations, of grave violations of the rights of children in conflict. And all of these rights now are violated with absolutely total impunity, absolute impunity. I don't think there's a single general, a single actor on those battlefields in Syria that is really thinking, if I land that shell in that school, will I be held to account for it? I don't think, or I doubt, that anyone in the Saudi high command, when they release those bombs on Yemen, British-made bombs, by the way, in many cases, um, is sitting there thinking, well, if I press that button, is there any prospect of that property in Knightsbridge being taken over by UK authorities for war crime? I don't think anyone, anyone is thinking that. And what, what we are seeing in our generation is a systematic attack in many different environments on what I would describe as the three fundamental pillars for the protection of children and civilians in conflict. Those fundamental pillars are the Geneva Convention, which include provisions against the use of high explosive ordinances in highly populated areas. It includes the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the world's most widely endorsed convention, which explicitly outlaws this, the type of attacks on children that we've seen. And it's eroding the pillar of international criminal law and the Rome Statute, which includes oversight of crimes like genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And the fact that we have these three great institutions that actually reflect the best of humanity, that were born out of the appalling tragedies in Europe in the Second World War. And I'd really encourage people to read, there's a wonderful book called, uh, by Philippe Sands called East West Street, which is a, a, a magnificent oversight of the origins of the Rome Statute um, and the provisions on, on genocide. Um, one of the things that we're doing in Save the Children now, as we, as we gear up for our 100th anniversary 
or our centenary year next year is to really try to focus attention on the challenge of restoring the armour that should be provided by these three great canons of law. Um, actually, Say the Children was founded 100 years ago precisely to protect children who, who were affected by war. And so we have a special responsibility to do that. But what, what I've been very much struck by is, is really our collective failure. Um, you, you, you know, we're, we're a world that is divided on very many things. But you would have thought that if there is one thing that anyone with a moral or ethical base or any society with a moral or ethical base would be able to agree that whatever we may disagree on, we will come together to protect children from these heinous crimes that are being committed against them. Uh, rather than say more about that now, I'd invite questions on it um, uh, after. I think there's a lot that we can do in this area because it's all too easy to look at these images on TV and to wring your hands and to feel horrible but get this sense there's nothing that we can do about it and actually there is something we can do about it if you look at some of the great drivers of human rights change in, in history they've, they've often involved what I very, would crudely categorise as three different things which is the creative use of shame you think of the way that the anti-slavery campaign has used shame to force changes towards the abolition <coughs> of, uh, of slavery, making these crimes known, naming the people who are responsible for them, ensuring that they get proper, uh, properly communicated to the world. Norms and rules. You know, it's really easy to say that normative-based stuff doesn't matter. The conventions don't really count for anything. The declarations don't count for anything. Well, it's true the declarations on their own can't solve problems, but setting a normative standard does actually matter. That, that's why in Say the Children, one of the things that we've really focused on is something called the Safe Schools Declaration of trying to get states to sign up to the principles that their military will never allow a school to be attached. Uh, to be attacked. The, th the third area is about how do we change the incentives and the risk calculation of people who are responsible for these crimes. Um, there's actually a fantastic book by Thomas Schelling, who is one of the originators of game theory, or the application of game theory to deterrence, which I think is very relevant to this discussion. And, and he says... The, you know, the, the core of deterrence is that you need a, an agreed authority to impose rules and you need a shared understanding that there is a joint interest in enforcing those rules. Now, I know when you look at our global institutions now and you bear in mind what I said about multilateralism right at the beginning, this doesn't feel like a conducive time to be conducting those sorts of exercises. But I do believe if we can build a global movement around this theme of protecting children from armed conflict, it is possible to make those changes. So I'm going to leave it there and uh, really happy to take questions or discussions. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Kevin. That was excellent. And I must say, as the head of communications, I fully appreciated the anecdotes. <laughs> um, they were excellent. I think they really brought the stories and the examples you used, really brought the, the lecture to life. And I'm sure it resonated with us all. Um, I guess you posed us some questions and challenges in, in that lecture. And I think now is the opportunity for us to ask you some questions. So I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, I'd like to take questions in threes. And if people could introduce themselves, just introduce your name and the course you're studying on or which institute or um, school you're studying in, that would be great. Um, so I'll open up the floor. <coughs> Any questions? Well, while you think about it, I actually might start with one that I've, um, I wanted to come back to you on. That you mentioned about um, large INGOs working in country um, and the contracting process between the multilaterals down to the INGOs, down to then local partners, and, and that potentially posing a problem. And I know that in your speech to the Bond Conference slightly earlier in the year, you mentioned about attaching historically, perhaps, 
perhaps the sector has attached too little weight to supporting organisations working to change policies and programmes in their own countries. And I'm wondered if you had thoughts on how we might redress this, um, particularly with a view to making and improving the international humanitarian system. So that's that's, okay. that's my starting okay. starting point. But very much want questions from the floor. So the guy in the white t-shirt, and then in the front. Hello, uh, I'm Sajad and uh, I'm doing governance and development at IDEAS and I'm from Afghanistan and my question is also uh, from the same context and we all recognize uh, that um, um, that there's, there's the, after the um, after the coalition forces withdrew from Afghanistan, so it's once again in conflict, and uh, and we see that uh, it and it makes it quite eligible for humanitarian aid and all, all other and, and development aid uh, because all forms of uh, 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 we can say war crime are, are are taking place over there, but still we see this trend that that uh, uh, that. A humanitarian aid agencies are pulling out of the country or either have halted their uh, support uh, uh, in Afghanistan, which is quite valid because they are being targeted uh, strictly. So in such a situation, I, I was wondering, and I would like you to shed light on that, that what could possibly be um, done in such a situation uh, to provide, uh, to, to still ensure that that humanitarian aid is uh, still extended uh, in a country which is <coughs> in conflict uh, just because the security cannot be a reason to banish a country uh, rather alternatives so what alternatives uh, do you see uh, that's my question okay and i think there was a question just at the front here thank you kevin my name's uh, Gemma, and i'm studying a phd in development studies at the school of global studies at sussex um, and i just wanted to refer to the ongoing investigations into sexual misconduct that is taking place at the moment and i know that a number of uh, ngos including save the children have made commitments to um, improving accountability to beneficiaries uh, and complaints and safeguarding mechanisms um, i was just wondering with reference to the quite phenomenal funding constraints that you mentioned how possible you feel it is to kind of meet these commitments and what the challenges might be Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, shall I yes. take those? Yeah. Um, so th this is where my lack of humanitarian knowledge will kick in in a big way. But um, I, I think both of your questions are related, mm -hmm. actually, and, uh, and the the answers are a, a, a very context specific because you know, the, the problems play out in very different ways in, in different countries but I think there are some generic issues um, what, one of them is that what, what we've seen over the past seven to eight years is financial authorities and development agencies in northern countries apply increasingly rigorous fiduciary standards to the transfer of resources and, uh, and actually this started in quite a big way once the US passed, uh, I can't remember the name of the legislation now, but there was specific legislation that was passed that applied not, not just to US financial transfer agencies, but to any agency anywhere in the world that made a financial transfer that didn't meet the regulatory standards of the US with respect to um, counterterrorism legislation and and I don't know if you remember but there were a whole set of remittance agencies including in the UK that were remitting resources to Somalia that were threatened with closure at that time but it has become increasingly difficult to meet the fiduciary standards that are required by donor governments so that's partly a capacity building issue but it's it's also you know a bigger regulatory question uh, <coughs> 
I mean, in, in all honesty, in response to your question, I, I think all of us in the international community know that we have to do more and better in terms of building capacity with local partners in the countries that we're operating in. It, it is often genuinely difficult to resource that in the way that we would like to do that. And I'm not saying that as an excuse because we, you know, we could still do more and better than we do. It, in, in, in some contexts, so, you know, for example, if you take the response to the Rohingya crisis, it is the case that because in um, Bangladesh there are large NGOs that already have institutionalized relationships with funders in the US and the UK and other countries in Europe that were able to intervene very effectively. And that's, you know, that's quite distinctive. I, I don't know the Afghan context as well. But I, I do know that, um, you know, as, as in many countries, it's incredibly difficult and often dangerous to undertake humanitarian interventions in Afghanistan. We actually lost four colleagues in Save the Children in Jalalabad earlier this year. Um, and, I, and I think this does come back to this, you know, what is often a difficult area that, you know, it, it, it's often not a question of, you know, are you overtly supporting state systems in the country that you're operating in it's often a question of are you somehow perceived as a representative of a hostile entity or as a supporter of a hostile entity and that, that is something that is incredibly difficult to control in, in many environments um, I'm very glad you asked that question on, on safeguarding you know, I um, some weeks ago I did um, I had to do an appearance. So I did an appearance at the International Development Committee on on this subject. And you know, this this is such an important area because it's not just important in its own right that we have a responsibility. You know, we are rights-based organisations and values-based organisations, and we we. You know, to say we're a values-based organisation, but we can't safeguard the communities that we work with is just not acceptable. And you know, you can point to resource constraints, you can point to the difficult operating environment. None of that is acceptable. And you know, and sometimes people put to me the argument that, well, you know, it, it's fine to have these high safeguarding standards in in principle, but when you're operating in these tough environments, we all know how difficult it is, and, you, and realistically, you have to have a different standard. And my response to that is always, you do need a different standard, and that is you need a higher standard. Because the people that you're dealing with, you know, they, these are people who have been traumatized, they've lost everything, they're disoriented, and they're coming into contact with people with power. You know, the power to ensure that your child gets a meal you know, the power to get your child into a school, you know, the, the power to get your child treated for acute respiratory infection or life-threatening diarrhea. And there is a consistent pattern in these safeguarding issues. And I'm, I'm not, you know, this is for all agencies that I'm talking about here. And that pattern is men in positions of power abusing that power. And we just have to get more alert to the problem. We have to invest more in training. We, we have to get better safeguarding systems in place. You know, we're, we're trying to in introduce a system in Save the Children now where any safeguarding incident anywhere in the world is escalated from where it happens up to head office within 48 hours. Um, and then within that, that it's also referred to local authorities. Now, you know, there, there are plenty of complexities in all of this, which we could spend the next hour discussing. You know, to give you one example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where, I mean, I'll give you one very concrete recent example. So, we, you know, we have a large-scale education program, which involves um, employing teachers who are contracted to government. And the, the, without going into locational details, there were incidents involving those teachers um, behaving inappropriately with young girls in their classes. But the, these are teachers who are under an employment contract 
with the DRC government. So our legal standing in relation to those teachers is limited. And as a foreign NGO, you cannot bring a case in a Congolese, in a, in a DRC court against a national citizen. So you know, there are a lot of complexities in how you do this. N you know, none of that is an excuse for inaction. And since we're on the subject, um, I'll, I'll also add that you know, a lot of those safeguarding issues um, are, have been about things that happen overseas. We, we have plenty of issues that we need to clean up in our own organisations, in our own head offices as well. And I don't, I don't think this is unique to the NGO sector. You know, it, it's true of virtually every institution you can think about, from you know, the BBC to, 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 to football clubs to industry. But the UK Parliament itself. To the UK Parliament it, itself. The politicians haven't particularly mentioned. Sorry, do I? <laughs> <laughs> it feels so angry at the minister the way she said, you know, root this out and bomb, bomb, bomb. Yeah, <laughs> but but the but but the the thing I would say about that is that you yeah, just just to be completely honest about this, I, I think the great service that Me Too has done our generation is to confront men with the reality of what unequal power relationships look like in the real world, and. I'm not going to do this experiment, so don't, don't worry. But if, if I asked every woman in this room to put a hand up, if they'd ever been subjected to an incident where they have felt threatened, degraded, in some way humiliated, in some way challenged, I, I suspect the vast majority of women in this room would, would, would put their hands up. That, that, that is the problem that we have to deal with. And I, I think you know, responding to these real challenges in a defensive way is wrong. I mean, R Richard is right. There's a hell of a lot of hypocrisy yeah. floating around around this issue. But the underlying problem is a real problem. And I think in the same way that you know, the civil rights movement forced us to look at race in a different way, I think the, the, the great service of the Me Too movement is to force us to look at the consequences of unequal gender relationships in a, in a different way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, more questions, comments? Uh, one at the back, um, and there's another one just on the other side. Hi, my name's Kat. Um, I'm doing development studies at IDS, and I was just wondering if you could, well, I guess I'm wondering your opinion on whether or not sort of media narratives surrounding certain crises affect the narratives that then humanitarian agencies kind of put out in their, in their requests for aid and funding. Thank you. Yeah. I think there was one there. Um, uh, Lee, uh, Masters International Relations, Global Studies. You spoke about, uh, I thought it was interesting you referenced like British uh, selling arms and weapons to these conflicts. And you kept on talking about, you know, these organizations having to do more. So what I feel it's like a catch-22. What's your take on this entire industry when these conflicts are generally speaking created by US, UK, the weapons funded are US and UK, and the people funding you to help these very same people are US and UK. Like, um, it sounds pretty much just a pathetic industry for you lack of a better word. So I just want to say, what's your take on people who want to go into it, knowing that you know, it's two, the same size of funding, the mending, and the breaking of the situations at hand? Yeah. Great. Any more questions? Just one there. Um, hi, my name's Joe. I'm a human rights master's in global studies. I used to be a teacher. Um, I'm looking at my master's looking at education in this country with when you were talking about raising awareness that we can do something to make a difference for me it stems with um, identifying our own privilege in our own country and what that stems from and how then that lies with the responsibilities to do something and for me teaching it telling adults that who are busy with lives who, don't, who feel pretty stuck in this country as it is it's a difficult concept to reach further out to do something 
So in terms of education within our own schools in England and you know, Europe, whatever it is, um, how do you see the introduction of the exposing of the systems as they are, if you like, the continue, the kind of cycles that we're talking about, the perpetuation of conflict, vested interests, political um, corruption, I suppose, that so kids come out of school aware of what's going on in the world? Because I personally feel English are very unaware of political rights, etc. because there's no consequences to the actions that we have here. So, um, yeah, what, are your, what your perspective is on what we could do within our own education system to raise this stuff. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Let's take those. Um, well, the, the, the first question was on media. And, you know, you, you just can't overstate the significance of media and media narratives at many, many different levels. So, uh, you know, to start with, the issues that get on the humanitarian agenda are very heavily influenced by what the media decide to take up. Um, you know, th there's a reason, if you, if you look at the humanitarian appeal for the Central African Republic, it's one of the most underfunded of all the appeals, and you know, there are reasons for that. But one of those reasons is it's not, it doesn't appear very prominently on the, um, on the media landscape. You know, countries that are perceived as being in the strategic interest of, um, of you know, of, of, a, of, of, of the West, of, of the UK, of the, you know, of the major humanitarian donors, are countries that do figure much more prominently in, in media narratives. Me, media narratives also influence how, how people look at countries. You, you know, that I'm often struck, you know, just, just having spent more time in Somalia in the last year or so, that, you know, if you, have, if you ask the average person in the UK, if I say the word Somalia, what do you think of? They, 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 they presumably reply something like Al-Shabaab, violence, whatever. Yeah, that, that's true of significant parts of Somalia, but that is not the whole story of Somalia, but that is a media narrative outcome. You know, there's another aspect of media narratives which we in the NGO community have to be incredibly careful of, which is that you present people or countries as victims of circumstances beyond their control. So, uh, you know, that I, 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 there is, there's really interesting work that goes on on how media narratives inform and influence the public and policy makers. And I think we all have a responsibility to ensure or to do the best that we can to make sure that we don't fuel narratives which are stereotyping countries or, 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 or people. Um, I mean, the, the other two questions were really both about the same thing. And I, the, look, I, I complete what, what, what you said, you hit the nail on the head with the question, so I, I can't really think of a particularly good answer to the question. But the, the, the reality of people who are involved in working for change in a country like the US or the UK or most of Europe is that there are dilemmas that you have to deal with. And, you know, the, you're often, you, you know, you're in countries which are major arms exporters, which are also the biggest financers of humanitarian aid the biggest sources of development finance. And, you know, of course, you, you would have to be pretty naive to believe that there's absolutely no connection between humanitarian aid and strategic or foreign policy interest. The, what, what I would say, though, is that, you know, we all have a responsibility to work for change. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do in Save the Children is, to, is, is two things in this regard. One of them is to highlight the consequences of UK arms exports to Saudi Arabia. Another is to lobby very vigorously, both publicly and behind the scenes, for a ban on US arms exports to Saudi Arabia. Um, and thirdly, to engage with people in the military and in other sectors about what are the practical things that can be done to more effectively protect children in armed conflict. I mean, just to give you one example of that, you, you know, an area that has been incredibly under-researched 
is the impact of blast injuries on children. So around half of the casualties in um, urban environments from blast-related injuries are children. And there's always been a sort of blithe assumption that a blast injury is a blast injury is a blast injury. Um, but all of the protocols for treating blast injuries have been drawn up for adults. Now, if you just think of basic anatomy, a blast injury affects a child in a very different way. They're much shorter, so it's, they're much more likely to have their face and their neck and their chest affected. In fact, they're three times more likely to have their face, their chest or their neck um, affected. Their bodies are still growing, so if their bones get shattered, it has different consequences than if the bones of an adult get shattered. And there are, there are many, many other examples. Now, we're doing some... We're working with Imperial College, um, and people from the UK military, doctors who have served in the UK military, to try to improve our understanding of the impact on, of blast injuries on children. You know, th this is an area in which the knowledge of the military can actually de be deployed incredibly effectively. And it's a small example, but it's a, you know, I think it's a sort of illustration of how we can engage to try and um, improve. The, th on, on, on the point about education, the, the, I completely agree. So you, I think the point that you're making is that if, if you want to create critically informed citizens or develop critically informed citizens, the only place you do that is through the education system. Or one of the main places you do that is through the education system. But one of the things I'm always incredibly impressed by, and I, I do quite a lot of talks in schools, that school kids get this stuff in a way that adults don't. And it, you, if you talk about you know, what I was describing about what is happening in Yemen of a thousand schools being bombed, you know, kids, I would say, understand a lot of these basic justice issues. I mean, they may not have read the Convention on the Rights of the Child or the Rome Statute, but they get these issues in a way that adults would often take two or three steps to, to get there. So, you know, I, I think every school in our country ought to be, you know, in a globalised world, I think every school should have a sort of civics course where children are thinking about what does it mean to behave ethically and responsibly in a world where you are connected to the citizens of other countries through trade, through commerce, through communications, through investment, through travel, and, and all of those areas. So, you know, I'm, I'm a very strong advocate for exactly what you're driving at. i just say that I have the understanding of what... 10 years as a teacher. Is that kids get the understanding of the end product of something. They see death and they see violence and they go, that's bad, and they get there quickly. But I'm talking about the systemic problems within our own country that we're therefore producing these things indirectly. I mean, being switched on and then questioning our own systems because that systemic um, naivety is what they take into 18, then they get in jobs and then they switch off. And... and unless it is instilled at that age, I personally feel, I, I get what your point is, they, they emotively move towards it and they say it's wrong and they've got a sense of right and wrong and a moral justice. But you don't yeah. have to teach them that. What would they, I feel, do you think they need to be taught not just those problems, but how to then question their own, the people above them, question authority, you know, to become genuinely politically active? Well, uh, you know, I mean, education systems are there, or they ought to, they, they ought to be there, to cultivate a culture of questioning. I mean, that, that's what education, if, you, you know, if, I mean, I, I know there's such a strong focus now on, you know, teaching to the test in, in schools and exam-oriented education. But, you, I mean, to my mind, the education system should be a crucible of learning and questioning. And civics is a really critical part of that. Now, there, there are actually a lot of schools, including primary schools, actually, that we're connected with, who, who I, I think are, are doing that. I, I don't know enough about the subject matter to know whether it's embedded in the curriculum more broadly. And I know there are very worrying things going on in the curriculum in the way that it's being narrowed and, and so on. But, again, really just to agree with the tenor of the, of the, of the question, that I think it's the right, the, the, the right approach.
Okay, thank you. I think we've got um, room for a final couple of questions. So there's one just at the front here and one just behind. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I'm a student uh, who's studying Masters in International Education and Development. And uh, I, it was so inspiring to see your presentation because I could feel your motivation and, and inspiration in humanitarian work. So I would like to know uh, how you keep yourself motivated in humanitarian work. Because as I know that you've been working with UN and INGOs for a long time until becoming a, a senior director of this organization. Because I've been working in UN uh, as a UN volunteer and then sometimes I, lo I lose my motivation because I, I have to face the like, huge uh, hierarchy mechanism and organization. But even if I have a I really want to uh, devote myself in the development field. It's really, sometimes I get frustrated by the mechanism. So how, how could you advise uh, like, uh, to, to us, like uh, junior development workers, like, to stay motivated? Right. Thank you. And it's just there. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, IDC, yeah, IDC team, uh, because I am guest participation for these uh, seminars. Uh, I am from Turkey. My name is Mehmet Akif. I have worked at uh, UA, a Turkish humanitarian idea. Uh, uh, I I mostly responsible to cash for work project uh, in Gaziantep near to Syria. Uh, we, we work for the Syrian people in the Gaziantep. Uh, my question is, uh, will be about uh, reflection, reflection, uh, and uh, humanitarian architecture and challenges. Uh, for example, in Syria, we see uh, that the uh, RHP uh, 28 is yet to be uh, finalized of the government uh, has not responsibility for uh, people in Syria and uh, but uh, continuous human surfing in Syria what should be position of humanitarian organization in this in this case and also other my question uh, do you have any challenge for work in Turkey? Uh, and uh, we will be we will we will be uh, work working in the Turkey after this time. And Thank you. sorry for my English because I no, came to I came to Brighton two weeks ago for my. improv English and thank you very much. Yeah. Your your English is great. Yeah. Okay, I think we're just. Take those two. Okay. Um, I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so, well, I, what I would say, look, I, I worked in the UN as well, and I'm not going to talk about the specific agency here, but um, I was working on education in the UN. And one thing I, I often used to be struck by would be you know, you, you would do field visits to a slum in Africa or a very poor rural area, and you would meet these extraordinary people, you know, mothers who would move heaven and earth to get their child into school. Even if the school was rubbish, you know, this drive to get their kids into school, or you go to a rural area and exactly the same thing. You know, I, I once met this little boy in... Um, Democratic Republic of Congo in North Kivu, actually, who I spent, I spent half a day with him. And um, he was selling charcoal in the morning to pay to go to school in the afternoon. And then I would go back to the UN. And you'd sit in these conferences on education. And, you know, the desperation of trying to stay awake while experts reflected on the curriculum or God knows what. And I don't know if you guys have read Harry Potter, but 
you, you know, it was sort of like the dementors were in the room, sort of sucking the energy out and <laughs> paralyzing everything. And then you contrast that with what you'd seen in these slums. And, and you know, I've, like, I'm incredibly lucky in the, in the job that I do uh, at, at many different levels. So, you know, every day I'm working in an office of, you know, just amazingly committed, high energy people who you know who wouldn't express it in these terms but you know they go to work every morning because they have an idea that they can make a difference for a kid somewhere in the world that will improve their lives and that that's a values thing you know, that that is about you know it, it's it's an expression of what you're describing the, you know this idea that i can do a small act of kindness of compassion of solidarity with someone I'll never see in a country I may never go to, but I can do something. And that, that is what underpins universal values, actually. And that, that is an incredibly precious thing. And then I, I do field visits. And, you know, I, I gave you the example of um, Yemen before. When, when I met that um, little girl, I was with a colleague called Mariam, who is head of our program in Hadeda, and she's a doctor. And you know, she's just so passionately committed to children in her country. You know, if, if she wanted to, she could at least say the children tomorrow, go to Saudi Arabia and get a job as a consultant. But she chooses to stay in her data. So, because she believes she can make a difference for these kids. And, and I think you're being part of an organization that connects you to amazing people. You know, people who are brighter than you, have got more skills than you, all that, you know, that, that is a gift and a privilege, and that, that is a source of energy and a source of motivation. Which is a terrible answer to your question, because I've, I've no idea what the general answer to how one motivates one, oneself is. But you know, I, I think the key thing is never lose sight of the purpose of what you're doing. And if you're working for a good thing, you know, even if there are difficult days and tough stuff, happens, you know, a, 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 a good thing is something worth working for. So that, make that your motivation. There's probably a meditative technique <laughs> that I'm totally ignorant of that would do this way better than, than, than I could. And what, on, I, I actually don't know um, Turkey very well, but um, even though I don't know Turkey very well, I, I did once write, actually a couple of years ago, a report about the Syrian refugee crisis, which included a section on Turkey, which I'd be really happy to give you um, a link to. But I think one of the challenges in Turkey is, well, there are many challenges linked to the Syrian refugee crisis. So in, in those areas which are near the border, you have this very large now Syrian population that um, still many of whom still have quite limited access to education, to health, and in particular to employment, and there are very high levels of poverty. And we know from our work and the work of others that many of these children are ending up working in factories, in some cases in Istanbul or in other areas. So I, you know, I think there are enormous challenges in Turkey. But what, what it also reflects is that when you get a crisis like Syria and you get a very large movement of people from one country to another, you, you know, in the UK, if you read some of the newspapers in this country, you know, you, you would think we have a refugee migration crisis. Um, that Uganda crisis I spoke to you about before, th there were more South Sudanese refugees crossing that border into Uganda in one day than the UK has taken in in the last three years. So 80% of refugees in the world are now in countries like Turkey, Ethiopia, Uganda. And we don't have an international system to support the host governments and the host communities in those countries. So I think that is the biggest or one of the biggest challenges for Turkey. I, d I don't know enough about the Turkish government's response. You, you, you would know way more about that than, than I do. Yeah. It's, it's for for, uh, for uh, many organizations, is, uh, there is uh, some problems because for now it's not a uh, it's not a uh, safe uh, safe routes for all 
organization and uh, uh, for example NRC and uh, cancel our project and uh, they 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 go to uh, they went to uh, uh, Jordan and other organization like this thank you thanks okay well, unfortunately, we've got to draw this to a close, but thank you so much for a really rich lecture and really full and frank responses to all of our questions. You, you referenced some books throughout the lecture, so I might call you, call you on that and okay. ask you if you can send the links and then we can circulate to people, um, which would be great. But just really, again, to say thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. Leave a last round of applause.